Right. Hi there. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to uh, mute you because uh, we're expecting a lot of people. So um, to uh, avoid any feedback, uh, you're all going to be muted. Um, I'm hoping that uh, there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions at the end of it. So at which point uh, might uh, unmute people to ask the questions of Greg. Um, so somebody, I can hear somebody's uh, uh, not muted there. So if you could all mute yourselves, that'd be really helpful. Because um, this, this event sold out in record time. So we're expecting quite a big crowd, which could get quite difficult with uh, um, people aren't uh, muted. So, um, yeah, so just to uh, welcome you all here. Um, my name's Paul Wood. I'm one of the organizers of the Urban Tree Festival. Um, the Urban Tree Festival has been running uh, since the 16th and carries on until uh, the 24th of May, which is Sunday. Uh, we've got a packed schedule. Um, so please look at our website to see what we've got coming up. Um, hopefully there'll be other things that you'll be interested in. Um, as I say, this uh, um, event was proved to be extremely popular and uh, was booked up um, very, very uh, quickly. Uh, so much so that we're going to um, run it again on Saturday. So uh, if you love it so much, you better book up for that one. Um, just going to give it a couple more minutes to let everybody join. We're getting quite a few people in the waiting room. Um, I'm going to paste in a uh, a little uh, spiel for you as well. Um, the um, Urban Tree Festival is uh, run entirely by volunteers um, and uh, we're very grateful if you're able to donate to keep the festival running and uh, we hope to go from strength to strength next year. So if you are able to donate, that would be very much appreciated. And uh, I'll um, be typing in a um, uh, link to where you donate if you uh, feel able to a bit later. Um, so just as we're getting everybody on, um, I'll introduce Greg, who's going to be taking us around the ancient trees of London this evening. So Greg Patman, we're very pleased to have with us. Um, and Greg is a senior tree inspector at Islington, at the London Borough of Islington, and also the co-chair of uh, London Ancient Tree Forum. Um, so I think without further ado, I will um, hand over to Greg and uh, let him uh, introduce himself if I've missed anything and uh, take it from there. So thank you all for coming and enjoy this evening's presentation. Greg. Hi, so I'm yeah, Greg Patman. I'm, I'll be leading this um, walk slash talk tonight. Um, as Paul mentioned, I worked for Islington uh, Borough Council before that. I was at the Royal Parks where I was involved in some ancient tree management there. Um, but also with the London Regional Group of the Ancient Tree Forum. Um, so I think we're, yeah, we've got quite a few people in. So um, I'll make a start. I'll just start by saying that this has actually been probably the most challenging presentation I've had to put together because there's so much to cover on ancient trees. It's kind of where do you start, how do you pitch it out? So um, the way that I've broken it down, I'll sort of explain that first, is that the first section is basically going over literally what an ancient tree is. Um, they're so much more than just particularly old trees. I'll explain that and why they're important. And I'll be going to a couple of ancient tree sites to explain specific concepts of ancient trees. So that'll be uh, three locations. And then after that, There'll be a run through of some really really cool ancient trees across London and then hopefully if I manage to keep myself on track and well timed there should be enough time for a question and answer session at the end. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, if this doesn't work Paul please jump in if not I assume it's work. So yeah hopefully you'll be able to see uh, the opening screen now so yeah, this is the Ancient Trees of London for Urban Tree Festival and the Ancient Tree Forum. So, starting point, of course, is what are ancient trees? Because, as I said, there's so much more than just really old trees. Now, they're firstly, a life stage, but also a relative concept of time relating to each species. 
Each species has a predetermined lifespan that it can roughly expect to live to. And ultimately trees, like everything else, they grow over time, year by year, increment by increment. And then they'll grow across life stages. And each species enters those life stages at different times to other species. When a tree enters its ancient growth phase, its growth pattern changes. It's no longer focused on growing upwards and outwards. It takes a lot of energy and commitments and resources to grow upwards all the time. Um, so as the tree gets older, it becomes more difficult to do so. So we refer to it as they start to grow downwards, but they also grow outwards. And based on a tree's lifespan, it will enter the ancient phase at different times to other species. So an oak tree may enter maturity at 150 years old, or roughly so, but then become ancient at about 400 years old. A birch tree, on the other hand, a much shorter lived species, becomes mature at about 40 years old, but we class that as ancient at around 120, maybe even 100. So the concept of a, a tree becoming ancient, entering into that ancient life phase, is very much dependent upon the species itself. And here's a, a chart produced by the Ancient Tree Forum showing those life stages. So you've got seedling, same mature tree, the third is the mature tree, the fourth is the tree is what we perhaps call over mature, and starting to develop some veteran tree features which I'll explain later on. And the middle image, that's the tree coming in, starting to come into its ancient phase. You can see the trunk and the branches are becoming much, much faster and thicker, it's starting to get some cavities and hollows, the branches are dying back and the canopies shrinking a bit and coming down. And the second to last image, probably in the late ancient phase, you can see a really short, fat, squat tree with bunched areas of foliage. And then the final image is either senescence or, or death, ultimately. And depending on the species, that can be hundreds, if not thousands of years so that, that lifespan happens. Now, measuring ancient trees, the, the, way to, the best way to work out the trees, you can work out the life stage by looking at the tree, but in terms of working out it at a more specific age, we look for certain types of features. Now, branches are a bit unreliable because they can break and new ones grow. And the higher up the tree you go, the younger the branches are. But the trunk is always there and it only grows fatter and wider over its lifespan. But in terms of measuring, the trees add a growth ring per year. And the growth, amount of growth rings roughly equals the age of the tree. And I say roughly equals because there is a theory that really old trees, such as ancient yew trees, actually stop producing growth rings. Plus also, as trees hollow from the middle, of course, you can't measure those growth rings. So typically what happens is we measure the circumference of the uh, trunk or the girth at 1.5 metres. And based on the extensive knowledge and research, you can make an estimation of the tree's age based on that trunk circumference measurement. And here's a chart showing all the relative sizes for each each age, each species. Sorry. So something like a hawthorn becomes ancient at a much, much smaller size than something like a beech, which in turn is much smaller than an oak or a sweet chestnut for a yew tree. But you can see a yew tree, we don't class it as ancient until it's about six and a half metres in trunk circumference or girth. But also the length of that lifespan varies as well. Hawthorns and rowans are very comparatively short-lived ancient species, but the oak tree, looking at that, seems to spend the majority of its existence, if it can, in that ancient phase. Now we also talk about veteran trees when we talk about ancient trees, but what are they? How are they different? Are they a life stage or are they a condition of the tree? So ancients and veteran are Two terms that are often used to describe the same thing, but they are actually different. Ancient, as we've explained, is a distinct life stage, while veteran relates to condition. There are specific features that can be classed as veteran features, which we look for. And in terms of condition of the tree, as trees grow, they experience trauma. It can be drought, disease, storms, wounds, and others. These events damage the tree and create dysfunctional areas which can initiate decay. Now, a functional area of wood is effectively an area of the tree where sap 
sapwood is growing. In sort of tree biology, you have the heartwood, which could also be ripewood or wetwood, depending on the species. And then you have the sapwood. The sapwood is functional and living with water and sap moving up and down the tree. And every year as the tree grows outwards, it renews that sapwood. And over time, it, it, create, it, it stops functioning the um, heartwood, um, which then becomes dysfunctional. And the wood decay fungi live off the dysfunctional wood, but they can't really enter functional sapwood because they can't live in those conditions. They need aerated wood. So when damage happens to a tree, it disrupts that water flow and it creates dysfunctional wood. The wood becomes aerated and then fungi is able to grow and that's where decay can happen. Um, sorry, stress a bit. And also, this is what creates habitat within a tree. But in real terms, it's a bit of a combination of the two. Because trees have to be a certain age in order for these features to become habitat, and proper habitat. And it's really the formation of heartwood and then the development of heartwood decay, which is what initiates these um, really fantastic habitat conditions. Um, this is a, again a, an ancient tree for in production, showing all the different uh, veteran tree features, which can be basal decay, cracks and splits in the bark, loss of bark, uh, cavities, fungal brackets, sap runs, lightning strikes. And this is quite a well used image and it's very available on Google, you can just find it quite easy. So I won't linger too much on this, but it's quite a well used chart by the Ancient Tree Forum. So we can share it afterwards if people want to see. Now, why are these trees important? Well, it talks about habitat. And ancient trees provide vital, rare, irreplaceable habitats, be it cavities, decaying wood or water pockets. And there are quite a few invertebrate species across the UK that can only live in these habitats caused found in ancient trees and decaying wood. But they're important to us in terms of our history. Ancient trees can be centuries or millennia old that have significant cultural and heritage value. Think of all the locations in, across the UK, even in London tube stations named after different types of tree. Um, something like the Magna Carta, the ink was, was created from the iron gall, which is a cool wasp living on oak trees. Um, yeah, legends such as Robin Hood and King Charles hiding an oak tree is all part of our cultural history of these ancient trees. Also, these ancient trees predate the global plant trade, they predate selective breeding in nurseries. So, in modern terms, we have quite a limited gene pool, but these old trees have real genetic diversity and much more resilience has helped them to get to a great age. And they are the last living link to our ancestors. Uh, in Kensington Gardens, we have some ancient sweet chestnuts, which I'll show later. Queen Victoria grew up in Kensington Palace, so she may well have walked underneath these trees that we can see today. There are oak trees in uh, Richmond Park that Henry VIII may have hunted underneath. And we'll be looking at a tree soon that's seen almost everything in British history. So I've talked about time and while we, we can mimic and replicate some habitats such as dead wood and damage to a tree, we can't cheat time, we can't replace a crucial habitat of heartwood decay. We can bur uh, burrow into the tree to create cavities but we can't replicate that decay process the way that a tree can over time. And it can often take several centuries, if not longer, in order for those rare and unique habitat condition, conditions to create. And if we lose these trees, the habitat, our history and our heritage is lost without them. So they really are irreplaceable. Well, they, they can be replaced over millennia, but tomorrow they'll be irreplaceable. Now, the first tree, and this quite literally is the first tree, because it's London's oldest tree. It is the Tottery Dew, which is found at, in St Andrew's Church, St Andrew's Churchyard in Barnet in North London. And this is believed to be about 2,000 years old. So, ancient yew trees. They're the oldest trees in Britain, often exceeding a thousand years, with some, and in our case, the Tottery Dew, over two, believed to be over 2,000 years old. And across Greater London, there's 29 ancient yew sites, and that's from the ancient yew group, which is 
in a city as modern as London, it's absolutely amazing. You know, I think 29 isn't enough, as I think most people here would, but the fact that these still exist is amazing. And the, across the UK, we have about 1,300 ancient and veteran yew trees that are over 500 years old. And you compare that to France having 77, or Spain and Germany having four each. One thing that Britain has is an amazing legacy of ancient trees. And Britain as an island has more ancient trees than all of Europe combined, which is utterly astounding. Now the Toss Ridge is believed to be over 2,000 years old. And this was 20 years worth of research conducted by Barnet Council, the Ancient New Group and the Conservation Foundation with uh, a special project. And it's believed to be the oldest living thing in London. And I say, well, I say the oldest known living thing because there could well be some fungal species in Epping Forest or somewhere that's many thousands of years old, as is the case in North America, but we just don't know that yet. And this tree was already ancient at the time of the Norman Conquest, which means it may well have germinated as a seedling around the time, if not before, with the first, uh, the first found, founding of Londinium. So this tree could well actually be older than the entire Greater London area. So think about all the history that that tree has seen. It's, it's a huge part of our cultural identity is locked up in these trees. And often, ancient yews are often found in churchyards. And the trees are often older than the, than the church itself, as these churches are built on ancient worship sites where they revered the yew trees. Now here's a slightly better photo of the inner part of the tree, where you can see you've got some absolutely amazing patterns of the deadwood, as well as the living. They're such amazing, charismatic trees when they're ancient, they're just astounding. This is a slightly fuzzier photo of the tree itself. Um, I still haven't been to, been up here to see it. It's one that's on right on the top of my list of places to go in London to go see. Now, the yew tree, one of the reasons I chose this is to talk about the heritage and cultural value as much as the biological value of ancient trees. So the yew tree is one of the most sacred trees in all of Europe. Its longevity and resilience was a symbol of life, death, protection, and immortality. Every Western European culture has some kind of connection to the yew tree. Also evergreen trees, because of the per well, being evergreen permanently in leaf, it was a symbol of eternal life. Also you use, you can grow back from the edge of death, so they're seen as a symbol of re regeneration. In sites of ancient use, groves of yew trees or individual yew trees were often really sacred sites of worship in, in the pre-Christian era. So in terms of Britain's ancient history, the yew tree is as important as anything, if not more. It's one of the most important parts of British identity. This isn't really celebrated enough outside of tree enthusiast circles. Now, when the Roman invaders came in, they initially adopted yew trees to deliver sermons at, and that's where they built the early churches in trying to convert the natives, the, the pagans, so they adopted the worship sites that the yew trees are at. But being poisonous, the tree was both feared and revered, and the compound taxol from the yew tree is used in modern cancer research. Now, these next images, they aren't actually from London, but they, this is from Kingley Vale, where I'm sure some of you may have been alone. And it's just some of the most amazing collections of uh, ancient yew trees I've ever seen, sort of five, six hundred years old, if not older. This is just utterly astounding, this tree. Uh, this is my favourite one. Um, yeah, I'd really recommend anyone who can, when they get the chance, go to Kingley Vale because it's such an amazing place. And this is the rather unusual, uncommon Galladerma carnosum, which you don't really found on yew trees. So this is quite a quite a rare fungus. This is a friend of mine, Chris, who's a consultant, uh, shared this photo with me. Uh, moving on to our next site, uh, I've chosen Richmond Park, but this is more kind of to do with uh, deer parks as a whole. Uh, I've no idea where these red speckles are coming from. Um, yeah, sorry, so historic deer parks. Uh, some of London's historic deer parks are home to many of London's ancient trees. Uh, rural protection and continuity of ownership has offered a degree of security. The, although some land has been lost to um, 
Right, I don't know where the I don't know if you can see the red markings that I'm getting on my screen because they're not on my PowerPoint, so I'm not too sure. But I hope there's not an issue here. Okay, Paul saying it's okay. Um, so I'll, I'll continue with this. Um, so these historic ancient sites also have historic ancient soils, and these are important because they've had centuries of nutrient recycling, mycorrhizal associations, and uh, water retention. So this is really what helps uh, our ancient trees grow, is being being in these ancient being in these ancient soils. Okay, sorry, carry on. In addition to forest, pasture, and river meadow. The large areas of London, the deer parks, during especially the Tudor area, Henry VIII uh, had a real obsession with, with hunting. So large areas of London were deer parks, uh, rural deer parks, which is what needed extensive deer cover in order for the deer to live. And many of these were sort of pasture land where we had good open, open condition spaces for these trees to grow big. Now, Richmond Park is the largest of these historic deer parks in London, over two and a half thousand acres. It's bigger than all the other rural parks combined. And it has, you can see the amount of over 1,200 ancient and veteran trees supporting habitat for all manner of endangered and rare species. And here's a breakdown of some of the recorded species found in Richmond Park. 1,350 beetle species, which is incredible. Um, Richmond Park is a national nature reserve and a site of special scientific interest and part of that designation is due to its um, saprozoic habitat from decaying wood, the wood decay insects. And many of these in, um, invertebrates are dependent on ancient trees and the decaying wood habitat in these ancient, ancient trees to complete their life cycle. Now, this is the Royal Oak, probably the most famous oak tree or tree in Richmond Park and it's believed to be about 750 years old and looking at the image it kind of has everything that you'd want to see in an ancient tree it's a named tree the royal oak part of that cultural heritage it's a shorter squatter tree really thick trunk lower canopy you can see there's quite extensive hollowing going on in the middle areas of dead wood you won't be able to see it from this image but there's all manner of fungi and lichens and bacteria living in there also one of the great things about ancient trees that they've captured the imagination of people over, over the centuries. No less in artwork. This is a painting in Richmond Park by John Martin from 1850. So this is an oak tree in Richmond Park and this was a real coup from uh, a guy called Simon Edwards on our steering committee. He convinced the Victoria and Albert Museum to have the original of this painting to display the painting this week during the festival and we were going to have a corresponding walk in the park to go see this. I think the fact that we got that far at least is. But look at the big tree. If you look at the branching pattern lower down the base, this is what's believed to be the John Martin Oak in real life. This is, you can't get this from anything else really in in art especially paintings of people that you can still go see the subjects of this of this painting. This is um, yeah, really quite an astounding tree and it's just amazing that we can go see the trees in these paintings. Now, many of Richmond Park's oak trees are ancient pollards and I'll be explaining pollarding in a little bit. But they have these amazing uh, trunks and regrowth from the bolling as it's known, which is around the middle of the tree. And this is part of the amazing landscape. These ancient trees um, across Richmond Park is found in the bracken. They're just absolutely stunning to be around. It's just something very special being there. This is one of my favorite images from the Friends of Richmond Park. Now, if you look at the, the second tree just in the background, look at the size of the trunk compared to where the, the branches come off the crown break. You can see that huge difference in size from the really swollen, stocky trunk to the comparatively slimmer branches. In a maiden tree, a tree that's not been pollarded, there's a bit of a, the tree will grow up in each branch order, from primary to secondary to tertiary to outer canopy. There's a, there's a bit of a, a consistency in how the size of those branches reduce from one to the other. With pollarded trees, you have really thick trunks and comparatively smaller um, 
smaller regrowth around here. So that's kind of one of the tricks, knowing how to see these as ancient as ancient pollards. And my top visiting tip for Richmond Park is to sort of go in the early autumn, in the early evening, where you get that golden sun coming through, and it just illuminates the entire landscape. This amazing golden bronze colour, the trees and the bracken, it just looks absolutely spectacular. It's one of the uh, most spectacular sights I can think of, really. But the thing I wanted to focus on for Richmond Park was the habitat found in these trees, because I mentioned about the habitat value of ancient trees, but also the importance they are in Richmond Park. And this is an example. So for the, these are the different types of habitats that we find in ancient trees. This is a non-exhaustive list because there's far, far more. But the real key one is trunk hollowing because everything in the top part of this, um, to an extent, you can replicate through tree management techniques or inoculation where you're allowed to. But as I mentioned with that concept of time, you can't, um, you can't replace the time factor that you get in these ancient trees. That trunk hollowing is a natural process and the process of aging and decay and the late stages of decay, this is where the real crucial habitat value is. You can't replicate. Now looking at types of decay, I'll talk about the two main, there's more than two, but I'll talk about the two main types of decay. There's brown rot, which we see here. This is from species of fungi such as chicken of the woods with the beef state fungus. And these degrade the cellulose component of the wood predominantly. Now cellulose is sort of white in colour, very stringy and flexible. And it, it's what allows trees to effectively move in the wind and change their growth direction depending on where the sun is. Um, and you have a number of fun, fungi that, that uh, degrade the cellulose and it leaves behind the lignin part of the wood. Now lignin, L-I-G-N-I-N, is dark brown and it's very stiff and rigid. And this is what enables trees to stand up. So cellulose enables trees to flex in the wind and lignin is what keeps them standing in the wind. In human terms, lignin is like our bones and cellulose is like our muscles. So this fungi uh, degrades the cellulose, leaves behind the crumbled lignin. And you can see on the right hand image, it breaks it down into this sort of cubical structure. And then this is where um, sort of rare species come in because there's, there are some species of invertebrate that can only live on brown rot decay, some only on the sort of metaporous chicken of the woods mycelium in the tree. But as the decay goes on, other organisms come in, that decay gets recycled, it comes out as insect for us, and then it sort of tumbles out of the tree, as we'll see in our next image. And what happens is it comes out of the tree, comes onto the soil, and earthworms and other soil dwelling organisms sort of take the advanced stage decay and bring it back down into the soil. That's basically like the nutrient recycling process. So this is basically nature's recycling unit and it creates habitat conditions for very very rare specific species that can only exist in these kind of these kind of habitats. And this is an example of chicken on the, on the chicken of the woods, later for us sulfurus, probably the most well-known and charismatic of species outside of the like Eric. And you can see here in the middle we've got the decayed wood area and on the outside we've got the healthy functional wood and it's being de degraded by the fungus causing new habitat. So in arboriculture and forestry historically we looked at the fungi as being bad things because for safety reasons and you know uh, compromising economic yield. But actually fungi are real ecological engineers converting functional living wood into really vital crucial habitat for all number of species. Now white rot, you can sort of see how sophisticated the naming system is. We've got brown rot and, rot and white rot. We've also got soft rot, I'm not going to go into that. So there's two types of white rot predominantly. There's simultaneous white, white rot where all the components of the wood are degraded, degraded at equal measures. But this image here is something called selective delignification, which is where 
the lignin is preferentially degraded, but the cellulose is left behind, which leaves behind a very, very spongy, um, squeezable wood. And the actual lignin between each annual ring has been decayed. So I've done this in real life. You can actually peel off each annual ring like pages from a book. And what this does is this enables invertebrate habitat like this. You can see here these beetle channels. These are both from London Plain. And when people sort of say about the lack of ecological values for London Plain, these are two images that I, li I like to show off because unless it's really rare species specific invertebrates on the whole, it's not so much the wood species that matters, but it's the decay type and the environmental conditions. It's, sometimes it's more the fungus involved. And again, to sort of show off decay and functional and dysfunctional wood, the smooth, um, almost heart-shaped areas of the wood, that's functional sapwood. And you can see that we've got dark lines around the edge. That's the tree compartmentalizing itself, forming its own barriers, uh, preventing any, or preventing aeration of the wood and preventing any decaying matter come in. But then the decaying bit in the middle, that's dead, the tree doesn't need it, it's fine for it to be decayed so it doesn't try and defend it. And up until, in this case, someone came along with a chainsaw and cut it back, cut it down, it had been doing a very good job of looking after itself. And when people think of fungi, they only really think about uh, the mushrooms or the fruiting bodies, as we call them, sporophylls. But the actual body of the fungus that does the real hard work is these white sheets. Now, the real bit of the fungus is called hyphae, which are these tiny threads of, of fungus, really, that form together to create these sheets called mycelium. And this is what works inside the tree, secreting enzymes that. that um, that decay the wood, and that creates the decay. So when you see a, a tree that's fallen over, quite often you'll see white speckles or white sheets inside the tree, and that's the actual mycelium of the fungus that's actually decaying the wood. It's really quite cool to see sometimes. And trunk hollowing, I've mentioned it quite a few times. This is kind of what it looks like. So we've got Two different types of fungus coming out of this beech tree. We've got the southern bracket at the bottom with the brown spores around it, which is Ganoderma australi. Then above it, we've got what I'm pretty sure is the giant ash bracket. There's two types of fungus, uh, Perennoporia and Rigidocorus, that are almost identical on the outside, but you can't tell what they are until you cut it open and look inside. It's kind of a Schrodinger's fungus type situation. You can't work out what it is until you open up the box, so to speak. So there'll be all manner of mycelium working inside this, um, decaying the wood inside. And this is what it looks like at its end stage. So you can see, we can see daylight. This is a completely hollow tree, but the tree's still standing and this tree was still alive. And you can see on the right hand side how little functional wood is left, because that's how much it needs. It doesn't need that much to keep it going. In order to compensate for that, lack of functional wood, that's when the tree canopy starts to come down, as well as reduce sort of hydraulic commitments as well. But also, at the bottom, on the inside of this tree, you can see a bit of a black mound, and that's very late stage decay. So that, that's recycling at its end point. This is a lime tree in Bushy Park. Um, again, you can see the extent of decay that's gone on in the middle, and how little functional wood the tree actually needs to keep itself standing. And again, on that habitat valley of ancient trees, the moth on the right hand side was actually at the base of this tree when I, when I took this photo. Um, this isn't actually in London, this is uh, my local wood, but I wanted to include it as an example of trunk hollowing, how much can be decayed, but how little the tree actually needs to keep itself standing. I call this uh, the Nazgul tree, because to me it looks like a ring ray from Lord of the Rings, it's one of my favourite trees. Um, and this is another type of benefit of trunk hollowing, is we have the functional healthy wood here, and the trees decaying up here. And at the top, you could have bats roosting. They, of course, have their droppings, which comes down into that bit at the base, which, of course, creates its own microhabitat. Then water comes in, it blends, up, blends it up, it then moist, moistens it, which can create habitat for 
lots of other really rare and unusual organisms. And then it fills up the water and it spills out. I kind of refer to it as tree diarrhea, really. It spills out the tree, it comes into the soil, and then it restores the nutrients back into the, back into the soil to be part of nature recycling. And of course, we have these amazing habitats. It's not just about invertebrates and bats. You get all manner of birds living in trees. It's a bit unusual for this, this kind of duck, but it was really quite cool to see the duck taking advantage of this habitat. And of course, everybody's favorite, owls. Owls love, many of them need, tree cavities and tree hollows in order to have their nests. This one, would you believe it, was actually in Hyde Park last year. Hyde Park in Kensington Gardens is great for little owls. Now, aerial deadwood as well. It's not just trunk hollowing, but deadwood. So a whole variety of microhabitats, from large and small cavities, hazard beams and woodpecker holes, really important habitat. And years ago, this would have been seen as being untidy and potentially reinfecting trees. But luckily, we've moved on since then, and we know how important this is as habitat. Now, one of my least favourite terms in arboriculture and tree management is the term hazard beam. So this is when a branch has got quite long, and the forces upon it, probably from the wind, have caused a crack in the middle of the wood. So the wood opens and bulges out. Actually, you can see hazard beams in trees that are hundreds of years old, and they're still there, they're fine, and the trees drop to other branches. So they're nowhere near as hazardous as they're made out to be. But critically, they are brilliant roosting spots for bats. So one of the things that we should be doing is perhaps not seeing this other hazard, but being more aware of the critical habitat role it plays, especially for, for bats. Um, this is just an example of a snapped out trunk. This will aerate and start to decay in time. And this is another um, large elongated split in an ash tree that, that will create its own, its own habitat in time. Now, this next one, this oak tree, you might look at this and think, okay, that's just one type of habitat. But actually what we have here, up in the top, could be a roosting spot for bats. This brown rot here, you'll have specific fungi and bacteria living in there. You'll have um, invertebrates living off of that. At the base, that could be a spot for nesting owls, but then there'll be other species living off the deteriorating matter falling off here. This small cavity in the branch could be a good spot for tree creepers or nuthatches. And this dead branch here, it's a different colour to this wood, so it's being decayed in a different way. So that will create, again, different types of habitat. So you're not looking at one thing, you're looking at a tower block of biodiversity in this decaying area of wood. And these are just a couple of images of aerial fungi. So on the left, the shaggy bracket in an Otocispidus, that's the real ecological engineer, in my opinion. It's, it really sort of creates amazing cavities and a lot of species of tree. And on the right, the yellow brain fungus, or one of the species known as witch's butter, Tremella mesenterica. That's a much later stage decay that you tend to get on smaller branches. Beautiful fungus. It's always really exciting when you find that out in the woods. And ultimately, this is one of the endpoints that we want to see these invertebrate emergence holes and sort of insect boring galleries that kind of shows that the whole process is working. Now, moving on to the next spot, Epping Forest, where I'm gonna talk about ancient pollards and coppicing. So Epping Forest, another historic rural hunting forest, part of the old forest of Essex. From the 12th century, the introduction of forest law protected the king, king's hunting rights. It also guaranteed the commoners' rights to cut and collect wood for fuel and allow them to graze cattle. The wood was collected by pollarding and coppicing, which were two tree management and tree cutting techniques. And in the pre industrialization era, the wood fuel, charcoal from areas like Epping Forest and the Great North Wood, fueled London. But since the Epping Forest Act and the move to coal, pollarding has ceased, so we've started to lose a few of these trees from that pollard, sadly. So pollarding, this is an ancient beach pollard. This is in Copley Plain in uh, Epping Forest, not far from the Robin Hood Roundabout. I always refer to this area as being like the terracotta army of ancient beech trees, because there's just thousands of them. It's, it's really incredible being in that area. Now, 
a pollard is basically when a tree is cut back to either just a trunk or a basic framework of branches um, you can see you can see here and then the regrowth regrows it grows very straight and then after a determined period of time five seven fifteen years people come back and they cut off the wood because they'll use it as as charcoal for weaving baskets hurdles fences everything in a society based upon wood you would get from coppiced and pollarded trees so Epping Forest especially the northeast London Essex was just the real powerhouse of, of industry for, for an industry that relied on wood fuel you can't under you can't understate how important Epping Forest was for the development of London to be honest and you have these absolutely stunning ancient trees ancient pollard trees that we see now this is one of my favorites this is one of my photos from near the Queen Elizabeth's hunting lodge in outside Chingford amazing old tree and hornbeams one of my two, top two favorite trees um, hornbeam is very, very commonly found pollarded and coppice tree in um, in Epping Forest. Now, it, as a native tree, apparently it has less biodiversity dependent upon it than other species. But in terms of its human importance, its charcoal was really important because it burned at a very high calorific rate. And the wood is so dense, the hornbeam, meaning iron wood, was that. Um, it's a very tough wood that you would use as, as the, the, the middle cog of the cartwheel as well as really tough timbers for things like um, hand tools so like i said in a industry that relied on wood hornbeam was one of the most important and it's really the tree that took us from uh, an early medieval society into the industrial revolution and now you, you see these amazing ancient pollards. Um, again you can see how much hollowing is going on and how little wood is needed to keep it standing. Absolutely brilliant. One of my favourite things about them is that you only really get it on hornbeams, so you get these amazing monstrous faces. This one especially always makes me chuckle. It's, it's a very, very happy to see you face. Now, coppicing, basically in theory the same as pollarding, but here's an example which is done at a lower level. So on the left is a recently cut coppice stool, on the right is that regrowth. And the real difference was pollarding was done at height to prevent uh, grazing cattle and deer from eating the regrowth. And this is one of Paul's photos I finished off him. Um, this is, I believe, cold full wood in, in Haringey. So this is an example of what happens when a coppice plot regrows, is that it can, it can shade out the understory. So there's ecological implications in stopping pollarding and coppicing. Which is, which is a shame. And then reinitiating on that cycle can be quite ch challenging as well. But one of the great things about Epping Forest is that we've got that whole uh, forest ecosystem. So you have the saprophytic fungi which decay the dead wood, restore the nutrients back into the ground. But also they, they're quite combative against um, the more parasitic and aggressive fungi. And then you have the mycorrhizal fungi, like the fire garrick on the right. These are the ones that form symbiotic associations with trees, which they get carbohydrates that they can't produce themselves from the trees. And in return, they give the tree more water and nutrients that they'd struggle to get otherwise. And also they protect the tree from uh, more parasitic and aggressive fungi. So they're very, very important in maintaining the forest health, which is why you get much healthier, longer lived trees in the forest. Uh, here's another example of two more fungi. On the left, we've got boot laces, rhizomorphs from Armillaria, and on the right, we've got the decay, well, the sacrificial fungus, the oak maize gill. And also, in the forest, if a tree falls down, you let it grow. And this is an example of how a tree has fallen down, but it can regrow itself, it keeps on going. And ultimately, it can either die and decay or keep on growing. It fuels that forest ecosystem. And this is another example. This regrowth is maybe 30 years old. Again, it's a great example of leaving that forest process in place. Now, on to the next bit. Um, there are far, far more ancient tree sites than what I've just put here, but it's, it's too extensive to list. And there's some brilliant sites that I recommend going to visit. Uh, Victorian cemeteries have ancient sites, ancient trees as well. Um, I've, I've also 
uh, put areas of Bromley and Croydon because they're huge, huge areas and they've got a lot of hidden spots of ancient trees and old estates. So it's not an area that I know too well, but it's one that I would recommend trying to explore more. So one of the other aspects of ancient trees, going back to that cultural heritage, this is the bandstand oak at Hampstead Heath. So quite often our ancient trees were former boundary trees or marker trees, and this tree marked the location of the, of the, uh, of the bandstand at Hampstead Heath. And again, it's kind of got everything you'd want to see from, from an old tree. It's got basal decay at the bottom, some brown rot here, regrowth of the canopy, lots of deadwood in the canopy, and this cavity here in the middle, which every couple of years kestrels nest in, which is really amazing to see. Also at the Hampstead Heath, you get the hollow beech. Some of our oldest trees have their own special names. This is probably one of the most popular trees on Hampstead Heath because people love to climb inside it. And I believe the record is 14 children in this tree at any one time. Now, Brockwell Park in South London. This is an amazing park. It's one of my favourite parks in London. Uh, this is a, a near 600 year old oak tree. Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful tree. Uh, I took this photo in the winter, so it's perhaps not the best photo. But it, it's just, uh, I can't really describe it so well because it's just such a brilliant tree. The oldest in the park. And Brockwell Park is just a brilliant park in general, so I thoroughly recommend going there when you can. Um, I don't know if you class this as Kent or still London, but Lullingston Country Park, it's a site that I've not got to, but I've heard amazing things about the ancient oak trees in this area. So I strongly recommend going to visit this if you can. We've had a couple of Mulberry talks in the Urban Tree Festival, um, but there's not enough time for me to talk about it now. These are amazing trees and they're so important to London's heritage as well. When you think about James I and his failed Mulberry project, these are just astounding trees. So Lesnes Abbey Wood is a brilliant site as well to go to go see some ancient trees and ancient woodland as well. Um, ancient fruit trees and orchards, these always get overlooked, which is a shame because they're quite endangered. Um, brilliant habitat trees, ancient trees much, much younger. Um, and then the whole orchard habitat is just a biodiversity hotbed but we're sadly losing our traditional ancient orchards and we, we need to do more to protect these. Keniston Gardens is one of my old sort of stomping grounds. This is my favourite place in London, to be honest. These 17th century sweet chestnuts are absolutely stunning and these are the trees that Queen Victoria may or may not, but probably may, have sat underneath as a child. And again, you can, if you look closely at this sweet chestnut, you can see on the right where the old trunk has decayed away the trees form the new trunk on the left. This is another really cool um, ancient tree. And the most amazing field maple I've ever seen is in Kenston Gardens. This is an absolute stunning giant of an ancient tree. It's one of the only ancient field maples I know of this size. It's just absolutely amazing. Greenwich Park in South London again. This has got older sweet chestnuts in Kenston Gardens and these are just absolutely wonderful. Um, sweet chestnuts probably my favourite ancient tree species to be honest. They're just this, the, the twisted bark, the gnarliness of it, just the way that the bark separates and it's just amazing charismatic ancient trees. Bruce Castle Park in Harringay has got the Bruce Castle Lake, so the 500 year old Sessile Lake which is the 2018 runner-up of the Woodland Trust Tree of the Year. And this is a really important local landmark uh, tree as well. Quite often at the base, people come to scatter the scatter ashes of loved ones who have deceased, which is quite popular around this tree. Um, I can't ruin the photo on this, but Alexandra Palace, Alexandra Park in Harringay, has got some amazing old boundary oak trees from when the site used to be a dairy farm. Um, that's one of the parks I'm involved I work at, but that's, that's an absolutely amazing, wonderful park. Bushy Park has the most amazing ancient willow I've ever seen in my life. You can see all that decayed area going on inside that tree. It's brilliant habitat, an amazing tree. Now, final tree, I'm afraid. This, this is Hawthorne. I didn't get a chance to talk about Hawthorne. This is Bushy Park. It has quite a few ancient Hawthorns in it. Hawthorne's a 
brilliant treat for so many reasons, but in veteran tree management, it's a key pollinator because it has really nectar rich flowers that emerge at the same time as a lot of these saprozoic insects do. So when they emerge as beetles, hollyflies, what have you, they can no longer eat that resource of decaying wood and they need nectar rich flowers. So planting hawthorn near ancient trees is a brilliant resource for these trees. Hawthorns were traditionally nursing trees as well for oak as they, um, they would protect oak trees, growing oak trees from uh, grazing cattle and deer. Now, if you want to learn more about ancient trees, I'd recommend looking more into the Ancient Tree Forum and looking at, looking at their book, Ancient and Other Veteran Trees. Um, if you want to find ancient trees near you, check out your local Ancient Tree Forum regional group, subscribe to the newsletter, check out the Woodland Trust's Ancient Tree Inventory, or look at your local friends groups and societies because they might have good local knowledge. And uh, now, oh sorry, Ancient Tree Walks. I really should promote um, Tickle Media, a partner organisation of the Urban Tree Festival, as well as the Tree Talk app. And the Ancient Tree Forum and City of London Corporation have done um, Ancient Tree Trails for Epping Forest and Hampstead Heath, but also Ashford Common and Burnham Beaches. So I'd recommend checking those out as well. Um, and that is all from me. So thank you for listening. I'll pass back to Paul. Um, I've gone on a little bit longer than maybe five or ten minutes. So if there's scope to do as many questions as possible, then yeah, hopefully get some in. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Greg. That was fascinating. Uh, and I'm sure everybody else found that very interesting. Um, if anybody's, uh, there are a few questions which have come in the chat and uh, maybe I'll ask, uh, uh, to ask those people whether they might ask you them uh, directly. Um, so maybe uh, Ruth uh, has a question about why do you love hornbeam so much? Now I know that's uh, a, 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 um, a, a question that's directed to you but I'm, I'm with you, I'm very keen on beams as well so I'd, I'd be really interested to know what you think. So I don't know whether uh, Ruth you want to say anything, I'll unmute you if you like. Ruth, maybe uh, over to you, Greg. To web camera microphone. Um, so, people who know me know that I love a good story behind the tree. Um, I love the name behind Hornbeam, the Ironwood. I love the the fact that the charcoal from Hornbeam kind of fueled pre-industrial London. Um, I love. The look of them, I think they've just got wonderful leaves, wonderful catkins, just the bark, the, the fluting effect of the bark is just absolutely stunning. As ancient trees, they look brilliant. Um, I don't know, it's just one of those kind of weird things, it's just everything about hornbeams, I think they're absolutely brilliant from just from, from the way they look, from the way they decay, from the way they pollard, to the actual practical uses of them, I, I just, yeah. Get a bit obsessive over them. I can't get enough of them, really. There you go. You heard it from the horse's mouth. Um, so, anybody else got a, a question? Um, you can raise a virtual hand, and I'll come and, and get you to ask it directly. Or if you want to put it into the chat, um, let me see whether there's anybody there that wants to ask a question. Uh, there was there was one other. Uh, which is slightly off topic perhaps, but Abby's asking about um, uh, planting male trees. Uh, and um, I think that uh, there's a, a lot of that, uh, there's a perception that people are planting male trees over female trees. And I, I think that's probably uh, slightly untrue in London and uh, is probably something that's happening in North American cities that gets reported over here, but I don't know whether you've got any views on that. Yeah, so the my understanding of the origin of that, um, so I, just for the next question, I can see there's a lady called Teresa with her hand up. Um, oh, okay. So, um, male trees, because the female trees produce the fruit, they're located at the ginkgo, where the fruit produced by the ginkgo is absolutely foul smelling. Um, top tip from me don't pick it up while wearing gloves because you have to throw away the gloves. So they, they opted to go for male trees that didn't produce fruit because a lot of people complained about fruit making a mess. And they didn't really realize that high pollen concentration of 
the male trees would cause so many allergies. So my understanding is that it was basically to reduce the, the um, nuisance of fruit, and I don't like using that phrase, but I think that was the perception, and not realising the implications of all, 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 the, all of the pollen. So that, that's my understanding on the subject. Yeah. Okay, and I think it's, I think it's a, a very, it's a bit of an edge case in London, isn't it? I mean, there's not that many trees which are just single gender. Um, so is there anybody else that's got a question they want to raise your, their hand? Um, if, if we unmute Teresa Header, somebody, I can just speak her name. Teresa, have you got a question? I was a good attempt at my name, Greg, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm coming from a personal point of view, as you might get from my question, but obviously part of your job working for Islington, but it's getting that message out about hollow trunks are okay. I had a beautiful ash out at the back of me and it's been chopped down because it the trunk was hollowing and you know it is of just like tree officers are disappearing from councils so it's like how, how do we keep that message out because you were so clear mm. it was a great talk by the way you were so Thank clear you. on on you can have a hollow trunk it's fine <laughs> right so for all of the eulogizing i did at the habitat value of hollow trunks and also the hollowing of the tree doesn't necessarily make it unsafe. It's when what's on top of the tree, the canopy, doesn't necessarily meet the residual strength of, of the actual hollow trunk. The problems start to emerge and then when the load, so the impact of the wind, especially in storms, can um, hits, hits that canopy, sometimes that load of the wind can exceed the, the capacity of um, of the hollow trunk so yeah, there are times sense. where these these trees do yeah. these trees do collapse um you mentioned tree officers disappearing from councils that's a very real concern um in local authorities the tree officers like myself are the in-house experts who advise the council on matters of tree management health and safety and when those jobs are made redundant and um not replaced like for like but given to you know sometimes it might be someone grounds maintenance lumped in with tree management they don't have that specialist understanding and it's taken a lot of time and effort to really convey the importance and the safety of hollow trees and there's a lot of people who still have this old mindset of a hollow tree as a dangerous tree and there are unfortunate cases where trees are removed on health and safety grounds some of which i disagree with but there are other times where i can see that perspective because if you've got a hollowing tree in an environment in the urban environment where the potential risk is too high, like near a school entrance. There are times where the health and safety factor wins, but it's a case of doing things like the Urban Tree Festival, getting involved in Ancient Tree Forum, as well as people, like also councils valuing the, the importance of tree officers and consultants specialising in tree management is ultimately how we can um, retain more trees and having special explicit protection for ancient trees, which we don't really have. That's what we need as well, special protection for special trees. Great, thank you, Greg. Um, now, is there any other questions? Uh, somebody was uh, saying they were having trouble raising their hand. Uh, I don't know whether they have a, a question they'd like to ask, ask you. Uh, maybe not, um, but uh, I have. Okay, sorry. Who's this? But the one that can't raise the hand. I can oh, okay. Thumbs <laughs> up. <laughs> so, um, I thought you talked really interesting. I didn't know what it would be like, but it was really good. Thank you. Um, and I got my interest. I've always been interested in trees. Can never tell them apart. But my daughter was doing art, and she had to do. Um, she did a project on trees and she was saying that the trees have got a system how they talk to each other and that they talk to each other and they'll also protect other tr other trees if they're in a group um, that may be diseased or may be dehydrated etc by diverting some of their resources to them and she was saying that there's also a theory that they can warn the birds if there was a problem coming so I just wondered how true that was. <laughs> okay I hadn't heard the theory about the birds to be honest but uh, the rest of it is true. Um, 
it's a really, really bad phrase to say right now, but the concept of herd immunity works in the forests. Um, so also, I mentioned about mycorrhizal fungi. I probably didn't get enough time to go into it in detail, but w w with all the roots of these trees being interconnected through the mycelial strands of mycorrhizal fungi, that means that all these trees are literally interconnected and the, mycel the mycorrhizal fungi take carbohydrates and nutrients out of the tree, sugars, and they take it for themselves. And if there's a tree that's weakened, a dead tree of itself isn't a bad thing because there can be saprophytic fungi that protect against disease, uh, yeah. diseases, but they, they can divert that energy and resource to the weaker trees to prevent it being colonized by a particularly dangerous or devastating disease. Wow. Um, so it's part of that World Wide Web that Jordan refers to. Yeah. Um, and in terms of trees communicating, they can release, say, say there's an inf uh, insect defoliator uh, working on a particular tree. Mm. That tree can release hormones that the other trees will detect and then all of a sudden they'll they'll put more tannins and harm or chemical substances into their leaves to deter uh, insect defoliators. So I hope that answers it to an extent. Great. I found that really fascinating. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Thanks I've just, question. So I've, I've just seen a, a comment from Catrice. Yes. The, my favourite is the ancient oak and yew tree entwined together in Knoll Park. I've never been to Knoll Park, but I've heard amazing things about it. So I probably should have put that on my list of really great ancient tree places to go because that's somewhere I want to go. And I know the guy who looks after it and he's, he's pretty cool, good at what he does. So can I ask a question, Greg? Um, you talked mm -hmm. about a lot of trees that, are, you're, very, uh, that you're very attached to. Um, and I was wondering if you have a, a single absolute favourite out of all the trees that you mentioned this evening. Um, the Brockwell Park Oak is spectacular. Um, Kenston Gardens is an, an amazingly special place for me because I, I spent four years involved there. Um, yeah, I don't think I, I can really, really choose one. Um, no, I'm, I'm going to go for that willow at Bushy Park. Because you know, Bushy willow, Park. yeah, the willow at Bushy Park, because willow was the tree species that sort of inspired my career to work with trees, and that's an absolutely stunning willow. So I kind of I can't really choose between some of the others, so I'm going to go for, especially especially the hornbeams, but I'm, I'm going to go for the Bushy Park monster monster willow. Okay, great, thank you. So um, we're a little bit over time now, so better leave it there unless anybody's got any final questions but what i thought i'd do is um, ask everybody to type in their favorite tree into the chat just so we can get a sense of uh, everybody else's one and particularly if you're not from london or from uh, not from the uk as well we'd really like to know where you're from and uh, where your favorite tree is because uh, the Urban Tree Festival used to be a, a London only event, but uh, because we're online, we're everywhere. So um, if you've got any, uh, any comments, we'd love to hear them. Um, otherwise, I think uh, we'd better end it there. And uh, I wanted to say thank you very much to Greg. Can I say a special thank you to Chantal Mitchell, who said that they absolutely loved this presentation. So thanks. Well, there you I went, go. I went, I went a lot of stress over putting it together, so I'm happy to... Uh, well, it, was, it was worth the stress, Greg. And if anybody loved it Not so me. much, Greg is going to be doing it again on Saturday at midday. So go and visit the Urban Tree Festival website and book yourself on for a whole other go. Um, so I think as a final uh, farewell, I'm going to unmute everybody and we can all clap Greg so uh, he can hear this um, terrible sound of feedback. So here we go. Thank you, Greg. There you go. Right, well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, see you at some other events soon, I hope. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.